I think Ashish, if uh, he is not available at the moment, then you can start. Uh, initiate. Sir, am I audible, sir? Sorry, there are things about the interruption in the net. Hello. Yes, yeah, sir. Good evening, Doctor Apratim here. Ah, Doctor Apratim, how are you? I'm fine, good, sir. Good, good evening, good, sir. Good evening. So you are here. There was a yeah. There was a network issue or something, and suddenly disconnected. Okay, okay. Not an issue. Yeah. So, Ashish, Doctor Ashish is available. Yes, sir, he is available. Just Dr. Ashish. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. I, sir, I just called Dr. Ganguly. He is not able to connect somehow. Okay. So you start. Uh, you uh, you know first you sit this thing and then mm -hmm. give it to me and then I will mm -hmm. start. ठीक. Uh, the uh, can someone from the digital team just contact Dr. Ganguly and help him. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. So let's start then. My video is probably not visible, but uh, there is some issue. I will connect, uh, correct it afterwards. But I think we are getting late, so we should start it now. Good evening. Ah, uh, good evening. Good evening, sir. So, uh, Ashish? Yes, sir. So, uh, welcome to the uh, headache subsection webinar. Uh, it's end of the year and uh, uh, I wish you all a happy new year in advance. And today we have three interesting cases. Uh, and I would request uh, Dr. Devachish Chaudhary, President of IAN and Director, Professor and Head of Neurology at GV Pand Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research uh, to uh, chair this session and uh, introduce the speakers. Uh, thank you, sir. So, uh, good evening, everybody. And I think, uh, you know, this is the last webinar of this year and uh, from IAN and uh, that to on headache. And as usual, we are keeping the same format, three cases uh, with discussions. So I will request everyone to participate, ask questions, uh, however inconsequential or uh, inappropriate it may look like. Uh, and so we have got the first uh, talk by Dr. Opritim uh, Chatterjee from uh, Calcutta. And he is going to talk about something very interesting and which usually is a hush hush topic uh, in neurology. It's called uh, the sex headache or the partial headache. So over to Dr. Opratim, uh, you can share your slide and start. He is a neurointerventionist uh, working in Kolkata, Dr. Opratim. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, am I audible? Because my video yes, is sir. not, yeah. So I, I, my slides are visible, I believe. Yeah, okay. putting... yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, a very good evening and uh, happy new year in advance. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, giving the opportunity. So today, uh, the top, the case I will be presenting is a, a topic uh, which we often, a case, uh, patients which we often face in our OPD. But uh, at the same time, many patients uh, do not come to us also with the uh, same feature. And uh, probably because of various stigmas and issues. And maybe when they come, they, they may be too late uh, a presentation to manage. So the, the, the such a case uh, we are starting. So it's a coital headache and uh, the alarm not to miss during pleasure. So uh, this is about a 43 year old gentleman uh, presented with four episodes of sudden severe headache. Uh, 
uh, lasting approximately 15 minutes to 20 minutes each, occurred mainly during coitus. To be very specific, he said that it was mainly during the pre-orgasmic and the orgasmic phase. And it was slowly building up for 15 minutes. And then it sometimes lasted 20 minutes, sometimes used to last 25 minutes. It was so severe that he had to uh, halt the process. And uh, there were four such episodes uh, before he presented to our OPD uh, in the preceding three months before presentation. And the last activity happened approximately three weeks before he presented to the OPD. Mainly it was posterior in uh, location. It was throbbing and uh, it used to spread globally as well. Occurred uh, usually during the orgasmic phase, increasing in intensity and there was no history of any addiction or any other comorbidities. He was uh, uh, having a regular hygienic, uh, you know, uh, with a good sleep habits as well. No addictions and uh, working in, a, in, in an IT department uh, with no preceding, no preceding history of it so far. And uh, on uh, examination, uh, he was uh, absolutely having a normal GCS, no, without any focal deficit, uh, normal extraocular um, ocular movements, and uh, fundus being normal. There was no neck stiffness, no power deficit, no sensory, no other focal neuro deficit of that sort. Uh, where he presented to us with this CT scan from outside, which uh, did not show or was reported as normal. And uh, he was also worked outside with uh, an MR, with an MR NGO, where the report was normal and there was no apparently any uh, any suggestions of any dissections or any suggestion of any abnormal vascular malformation or any sort of aneurysms of that sort in his NGO reported normal as well as he, we also uh, saw the CD which he brought along with that. And uh, the MR, uh, the, the flare image also was not suggestive of any uh, you know, hyper intensities in the sulci gyri or any of that sort suggestive of any preceding SH. So with this, uh, we had a few possibilities in mind for such episodes, young gentlemen, uh, uh, to the extent severe enough uh, to uh, halt uh, the uh, sexual process. And uh, uh, he uh, presented approximately since last three months, he had four such episodes. And uh, um, for the last three weeks, he was relatively asymptomatic, but still came up for an opinion of that sort. So we thought whether we were dealing with a primary headache associated, uh, I mean, uh, associated with sexual activity, whether it was a, some sort of um, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, whether there was any SH, or whether there were arterial dissections. Having the, uh, the, the imaging and the investigations he had brought along with him in our OPD, the, the, the possibilities of SAH and dissection seemed unlikely or less likely. And we thought it to be probably a headache, I mean, a primary uh, headache associated with sexual activity. And we uh, we also tried to rule out whether there is any evidence of vessels vasculitis or any vasospasm. We asked for the routine blood parameters, which came out normal. We did a vasculitis profile, which was also normal. And the CSF study was done on a daycare basis, which was apparently normal with absolutely normal cell count, normal, relatively normal proteins. Was consulted in OPD and discharged on analgesics, advised follow-up if records, and was sent on beta blocker and indomethacin, thinking to be possibility of primary HASA, if at all. So having said that, he went home. But soon there was a call and uh, approximately, I would say, five, six days later. And yeah, it was, uh, again, a recurrence of intense headache. And this time the headache persisted. And uh, to the extent that um, uh, the, neck, uh, the, the, the headache was so severe that we had to ask for an admission in the emergency. And this time we repeated a CT scan. So the CT scan showed there, this time that there was uh, evidence of a subarachnoid bleed. Immediately, uh, um, though it was like uh, the, from the medicine department and the emergency department, the CSF was done. Apparently, in our SH protocol, we don't go for that. And there was apparent xanthochromia. We uh, immediately took the patient the next early morning for a uh, cerebral angiogram. And uh, we found that there was an aneurysm in the ophthalmic segment uh, of the ICA. Now, uh, why uh, it was a very small sort of uh, aneurysm, so so called a blister sort of an aneurysm, and in the paraophthalmic segment uh, of the left ICA. Having said that, 
uh, we offered for endovascular treatment uh, because the aneurysm was uh, very small, shallow, and uh, having a relatively wide neck, possibility of uh, coiling and other, other procedures were relatively difficult. So we offered an endovascular flow diverter and we uh, did a Fred flow diverter placement across the aneurysm. And after that, uh, we followed the patient up, which relatively showed only one mild intensity of headache recurrence. And uh, the follow-up angiogram, as you can see, after three months with the flow diverter in place, the aneurysm was gone and there was sort of a healing of the vessel wall. Till now, we had followed up for almost a year now and there was no recurrence of headache and no focal deficit so far. So the uh, uh, we thought that uh, initially what we were thinking as a primary headache, uh, primary HASA based on the ICHD3 uh, with two at least, uh, we had four such episodes uh, brought on only during sexual activity and it was uh, increasing in intensity with increasing sexual excitement lasting almost like 15 to 20 minutes. So it was also satisfying the criteria. What we thought out to be a primary HASA uh, we always tried to rule out whether there was an episodes of postural headache and it was after the um, event had happened or uh, there was any signs of any secondary um, um, uh, symptoms like any, you know, any loss of consciousness, any neck stiffness, but nothing of that sort was there in the previous four episodes which he came with initially in our OPD. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, the, uh, the ruling out of the cerebral vasoconstriction also requires to be noted that it, it is more likely to be explosive in nature, mainly during the orgasmic phase and to last for more than one month. Uh, it lasted, our patient's headache lasted for approximately three months in four various headaches. And uh, this was relatively odd for RCVS, though vasospasm may not be noted uh, in all the cases. So uh, uh, just, just to remind that uh, this sort of uh, headache associated with sexual activity uh, may happen in a lifetime. It is not that uncommon. And uh, various positions have been associated, though usually uh, during intercourse, it is associated most commonly around 90%. And there have been various studies to show that the various uh, positions may be uh, associated with various sort of precedence of uh, headache associated sexual activity. However, the point which needs to be remembered is uh, in a uh, relatively 40 year or a, a middle aged gentleman, having neck pain or stiffness or any loss of consciousness might pro uh, point towards a possible uh, subarachnoid bleed. Uh, though in our scenario, in our case, there was no history of in the neck pain in the preceding four events which happened. Uh, the only neck pain happened in the in the incidents where we noted where he got admitted and there was an obvious subarachnoid bleed. So the learning points to us were coital headaches. Complete workup should be done. Even MR NGO uh, or maybe uh, uh, may not be that sufficient, especially if not, uh, you know, the small blister like aneurysms uh, may be missed in the initial workup. So a good quality angiogram uh, may be required. And however small the aneurysm, in, in spite of the fact that we know from the ISAT study that uh, the, the size of the aneurysm in unruptured uh, cases do matter whether it will bleed or not, do matter for our decision making. In small aneurysms in ICA, which are blisters, they may have an increased propensity to bleed as in this case. So clue is almost always present in the crime scene. So we have to visit and revisit the evidence every time. And that is, I, I think I sum up the case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aprakrim, for a nice case. Yes, now, thanks. Actually, it raises a few questions uh, that uh, what do you think the headaches were due to in the uh, first four instances? Because uh, there was no bleed. And uh, you did not explicitly uh, suggest that because from your history, it appears that the headache was an acute onset, but it was not thunderclap in onset for the first yes. four instances. Right? So yes, what do you think is that uh, those four episodes, are they linked or this fifth episode is uh, possibly due to the bleed and the, the four episodes were, uh, you know, part of a primary headache? Uh, yes. Sir, uh, the, that is a question basically because, number one, you are absolutely right. The first four episodes were not thunderclap. He clearly said that it was building sort of 
it was not at all in the nature of thunderclap as we as we are accustomed to get in you know aneurysmal ruptures but whether mm -hmm. uh, this uh, uh, because it was satisfying the criteria of hasa we thought accordingly and we treated also in the opd and discharged but uh, whether this could be a manifestation of the sentinel headache because of the aneurysm yeah. uh, that is that is the question because you see when he when we got the csf he was already like a month back when he had the last episode so that is what mm -hmm. the whole purpose is that whether every hasa we know that we should investigate very deeply but how deeply should we go to the extent of doing dsa in all these cases because small aneurysms are likely to be missed in low quality mr angio especially in uh, mr angios coming from outside should we repeat dsas in these cases yeah so so from your history at least of the initial four episodes it appears that it looks more like uh, uh, either a hasa or uh, rcvs right because then yes. also you can get a normal uh, mr and a normal angio initially and only later you can get the vasoconstriction element right so yes. so so you know at, at least at that point of time of course when the obviously you see a sarcopenoid hemorrhage in the fifth episode and when there is a clinical correlation of a thunderclap headache then there is no doubt in our mind that it is because of the uh, you know rupture of an aneurysm whether the aneurysm is a berry aneurysm or a blister is a different thing but uh, obviously blisters have a more propensity to bleed and uh, so therefore there there has been a bleed uh, so i think uh, you know it, it it actually really perplexes uh, at times and if you see the natural history of the sexual activity headaches they usually you know after a series of bouts of events and then, then suddenly they die out they don't recur you know so yes, yes. Uh, we really you know i would be a little uh, skeptical in accepting that all the four would be uh, related to this particular aneurysm and that might have caused a sentinel because there is no evidence of sentinel bleed also i think you must have seen the gr in other uh, yes yes uh, yes other firms also and you might not have find any evidence of old bleeds or something like that so uh, that is one thing and the second thing i think in the history one important thing i would like to know whether this person was consuming something like uh, sildenafil or you know uh, no. those kind yeah. of drugs before the coitus because yeah. that definitely increases the chances of a, a, a kind of an headache being precipitated you know so so that history i think should be important for all of us to know uh, you know right sir so so we inquired sir he was not on any of these medications mm -hmm. sir number one there are two points i want to highlight rcvs the characteristic as we know from the clinical history is more of thunderclap but these four episodes were never thunderclap mm -hmm. they were gradually building over 15 to 20 minutes to the extent that he had to leave the sexual intercourse and he had to go go back and sleep so mm -hmm. basically um, like uh, they were never thunderclap so having this no thunderclap history clearly he mentioned that it was not suddenly out of the blue within one minute i am having maximum intensity it is never like that but mm -hmm. the last episode was thunderclap so could we class number this is one number number one point why rcvs was kept down the line number one number two was it it lasted for more than three months sir. so these four episodes lasted for more than three months is it very common in rcvs sir, in natural history because we know that it usually is rare beyond a month yeah yeah so i mean obviously if uh, if, if 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 the thunderclap nature recurs over a short period of time multiple th thunderclap kind of headaches then you obviously think of an rcvs if it happens in a sexual activity related headache then also you can think of rcvs as a differential so you know those you are right so that's why i think that there is every possibility that he might be having a you know a primary a headache with sexual activity that is number one diagnosis for the first four episodes and possibly he is having a secondary thunderclap headache a thunderclap headache due to a uh, aneurysmal bleed on the fifth episode so i think that that's an interesting uh, you know supposition based on your atlet chronology of events and and the way it unfolded you know yeah i see professor ganguly have joined good evening sir good evening i'm sorry i failed to connect because of right. some problem so you must have heard this case it's a nice case so i would like yeah, to yeah, ask for a nice case <coughs> Thank you. I'd sir. like to uh, ask for opinion on the house. I mean, uh, anybody can comment or you know ask what what do they think about it. 
any any comments so one more thing i want to point out the fact that we have followed this patient after the intervention for the last one year and mm -hmm. there have been only one recurrence with very less intensity within the first 3 months uh, before the check angio was done and since then that to, that to on on sexual activity Yes, sir. That too on okay. sexual activity, but very mild intensity. Mm -hmm. And after three months, he practically till last year, he has no such record so far. Yeah. So, uh, so in a way, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a way, if you see the conditions for secondary headache, that one criteria is that if you correct the secondary cause, then the headache yeah. should not recur and a headache gets relieved. Uh, uh, so in that way, uh, you can take it in either way because he did have one uh, mild recurrence and then he did not have any other recurrence. So I think there might be a possibility that, you know, that he had a basic, uh, you know, primary condition of uh, sexual activity related. And it is well known that it, it goes up for months and then suddenly disappears, you know, then it yeah. becomes all right. So, so, so it, it is possible. And then this was the, uh, so you can have a two. In fact, you can, you know, have, you know, uh, uh, write this up and uh, use this as a conundrum that what to call this as uh, primary or secondary or both, you know, one uh, diagnosis of primary and one diagnosis of secondary. So, uh, so I, I, I tried to put up your questions today or raise your hands or whatever. I'm not seeing any question and answers here. Uh, section chat also is empty, I think. So let's wait. People might think about something. Uh, don't go away, Aprotim. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So next, I'll ask uh, Doctor uh, Dugal to uh, you know talk about uh, case. Thank you, sir. Uh, so. Uh, so is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so good evening and uh, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Devachi for uh, giving this opportunity to talk. I'm going. This case was actually uh, we had worked up together with Sir only uh, orthostatic headache, and uh, this is a story of a 50 year old male. He was an auto rickshaw driver. He had come to us with a headache for three. The onset started about three months back when he was driving his rickshaw and he gradually uh, developed a headache of increasing severity so much so that uh, with, uh, that he had to stop his rickshaw and uh, it peaked over a period of around <coughs> half hour to one hour. At that time, he slept in his rickshaw and the headache was relieved somewhat. However, since then, he developed he used to have headaches intermittently almost every day and sometimes he would require even analgesics. Subsequently, he became aware that there was some orthostatic nature for these headaches. These headaches would occur during the waking hours when he was active and erect, and they would disappear when assuming a supine position. So the headache was holocranial, throbbing type. There was no nausea, vomiting, no photophobia or phonophobia. It was mild to moderate in intensity. And initially, he noticed that this dot did not increase with any routine physical activity, but subsequently would increase with day-to-day -day activities in the waking hours. There was no history of head trauma, any cervical trauma, any history of uh, any uh, surgical intervention in the spine or anywhere else. No other significant medical history and there was no history of any drug addiction. So the reason for presentation at that time was uh, to us was that there was a worsening in the intensity in the last seven days prior to the presentation. Uh, at the time of examination, uh, uh, when he presented, he was conscious, alert and the vital force stable, there was no orthostatic big drop in blood pressure or orthostatic tachycardia and all peripheral pulses were well felt. And the systemic examination also was non-contributory. So uh, on a CNS examination, again, there was uh, uh, nothing significant. Uh, motor system examination was also normal and there were no extra permanent signs, no meningeal signs as well. So uh, we had a, a middle-aged man presenting with a headache which had a significant postural component. So this was a red flag for a secondary headache. And uh, we did an MRI. And as you can see in this MRI, there was collect bilateral subdural collections in the bilateral cerebral hemisphere in the parieto, uh, frontoparietal convexities, which can be seen here. 
And on uh, the sagittal images, we can see that uh, the prepontine cistern had, uh, there is a decrease in the prepontine cistern, there is a overcrowding in the posterior fossa, there is some, it seems there is some descent. And uh, on the contrast images, we can see that there is some engorgement of the uh, venous sinuses, as can be uh, seen here. There is some dural thickening, there is some uh, engorgement of the venous sinuses. And again, there is an engorgement of the pituitary, the supracellular cistern area has been reduced, the prepontine area uh, cistern area has been reduced, and similarly, the mamulopontine area has also been reduced. So all these findings uh, were indicative of a, a spontaneous intracranial hypotension. So there is an index known as Burns index, uh, where uh, points are given for different radiological features, and then a risk score is calculated. So for our patient, we had, uh, there was subdural fluid collection, the prepontine cistern was less than 5 mm, memelopontine distance, as you can see, has also been reduced. The supracellular cistern is almost obliterated. There was pachymeningeal enhancement, thin dural enhancement, uh, smooth dural enhancement, and engorgement of venous sinuses. The patient had more than 5 points, was having high risk for having spontaneous intracranial hypotension. So uh, on the basis of this, we made a diagnosis of headache attributed to spontaneous intracranial hypotension. And uh, since he was uh, in a fairly stable condition, he was admitted in a ward, kept under observation. He was started on increased caffeine intake, fluid intake, and bed rest. However, the next very next day, he became drowsy. And that uh, for that reason, we had to do an urgent NCCT. And this CT showed that there was bilateral subdural hematomas had developed when what was a collection earlier. Now he had developed bilateral subdural hematomas. And probably this was the uh, reason for uh, his sudden worsening. And there was significant mass effect. As such, he was shifted to ICU, a neurosurgical consultation was taken. His GCS has also, has, had also dropped. And uh, for that, a burhole evacuation of bilateral STH was done. He tolerated the procedure well was intubated and uh, was in the ICU. So he was trying to open his eyes after the procedure. So he was trying to move his limbs. So there was some improvement in GCS. And there was some improvement in sensorium. The GC has improved from E2, V2, M5 to E4, VT, M6. He was in fact extubated and a repeat CT head was done, which revealed that the SDH had been evacuated and the mass effect had decreased. Uh, however, the very next day, he again developed drowsiness, became altered, uh, had into altered sensorium with poor breathing efforts. He was re-intubated and a repeat CT was done, which again showed that there was, again, there was collection of the fluid here with some subdural, uh, with hemorrhage. So after uh, doing a bar hole, he in fact improved and then again uh, worsened. So he was given supportive care, adequate hydration was given, but he continued to have fluctuating sensorium. Uh, CT myelography and a targeted blood epidural blood patch was planned. However, CT myelography could not be done because of his poor general condition. He could not be shifted. So we thought of going ahead with a blind epidural blood patch. And under aseptic conditions, uh, 15 ml of fresh venous blood was uh, taken and an ep uh, epidural blood patch under LA was done at L3, L4 level. And uh, post blood patch, uh, the, his sensorium started to improve. Uh, the ventilatory support was gradually weaned off. And patient was extubated and shifted to the ward. And this is his uh, video around six days after the. So this was a very rewarding uh, experience. A patient who was on ventilator uh, and was had, having significant mass effect and a simple procedure, epidural blood patch uh, had a very good effect. So uh, what are the salient features of this case? So this had an orthostatic headache, uh, patient had an orthostatic headache, and we made a diagnosis of SIH. However, we could not localize the dural leak. In spite of that, uh, untargeted epidural blood patch had a very good effect. And so uh, another important point is what to do in patients who have uh, SDH, in patients uh, with SIH who develop a subdural hematoma.
So uh, just to review, uh, orthostatic headache means that the headache occurs on standing but decreases or relieves on lying down. So this can be seen in, obviously this is characteristic of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, hypotension, but there can be other causes also. And those should be kept in mind, especially for the residents. An important cause is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, where uh, on standing the heart rate would increase uh, by at least 30 per minute. Uh, and this can sometimes coexist with some spontaneous intracranial hypotension, but this should be always be checked in patients who have an orthostatic type of headache, because the treatment is fairly simple. Uh, with propanolol and this is a fairly common uh, syndrome especially in the post covid uh, era many patients with covid have developed post pots and this should be kept in mind orthostatic hypotension can also cause in uh, orthostatic headache uh, type of headache so patients can have a, a neck pain occipital headache and pain in the shoulder areas colloid cyst is another uh, differential diagnosis where there is sudden headache on standing up but then these patients can also have sometimes they can have a loss of consciousness Migraine uh, patients also get relieved by uh, lying down. So that can be mistaken if a history is not taken properly. And it should, uh, but the relief in headache on lying down is not that prompt as is seen in uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Another thing about uh, the headache in spontaneous intracranial hypotension is that the patients may uh, tend to lose that orthostatic character later in the course of illness. So these are the diagnostic criteria for a headache attributable to low CSF pressure. So either we require a low CSF pressure, well, less than 60 millimeter CSF or evidence of CSF leakage on imaging. And uh, for some spontaneous intracranial hypotension, we require that there is no post, uh, no dural puncture in the last one month or any procedure or trauma uh, that is known to cause CSF leakage. And then headache is developing in temporal relationship to uh, low CSF pressure or CSF leakage or has led to its discovery. So uh, these are some of the signs which I've already discussed. Uh, most importantly, there is uh, enhancement of the pecky meninges, a smooth enhancement, subdural hem bilateral, subdural hygromas or hematomas, engorgement of the venous sinuses. And these uh, should be uh, looked, uh, we, one should specifically look for these signs in a uh, patient who has uh, suspected of having orthostatic uh, headaches. So uh, the other thing is how to localize the spinal CSF leaks. So this can be tricky sometimes and it's difficult. Uh, obviously, CT myelography is considered the gold standard in localization. And uh, uh, it can be done, the CT myelography can be done. One uh, procedure is to do a uh, epidural, uh, give the NS, uh, contrast agent uh, and then do the CT. Or the other is the dynamic CT myelography where the contrast is given inside the CT machine. Uh, so that is more advantageous and to, especially to visualize the high flow CSF leaks. But this procedure is uh, requires expertise and may not be available at all places. Uh, a non-invasive procedure is to do a heavily two-weighted MR myelography, which can sometimes give you indirect uh, clues of uh, CSF leakage, but it may not be, uh, it may not give the exact site of leakage because it often gives a false localizing site uh, that can uh, give a clue that there is some CSF leakage and there could be evidence of epidural CSF collection, distension of epidural veins, collapsed dura. These are uh, indirect signs that there is some uh, uh, spinal leak. Uh, the, so the treatment options are that the conservative treatment, uh, patients should be advised strict bed rest, adequate hydration, analgesics, abdominal binders, and uh, caffeine, theophylline, and corticosteroids can be tried. Corticosteroids can be used for bridging for some time before a more definitive treatment such as epidural blood patch is done. And the treatment of choice is obviously epidural blood patch, which can be either blinded, given in the lumbar area, or targeted if we are able to localize a uh, site of the leak. The mechanism of action is that there is a uh, early effect because of the direct compression of the dural sac and occupying uh, of the epidural space by the occupation of the epidural space by the injected blood and the late effect occurs because of fibrosis and healing of the dural tears. So the side effects of this epidural blood patch could be that there could be rebound intracranial hypertension, radicular pain at the dermatome of the injection, arachnoiditis can occur, there can be transient bilateral paraplegia and a corda equina syndrome can also develop because of the arachnoiditis. So this is an algorithm uh, for the management of patients with spontaneous intracranial hypertension. So if there is a uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension alone, then conservative strategies could be used. But if there is no uh, improvement, 
then we should attempt a spinal imaging for leakage localization and uh, do a targeted epidural blood patch. However, if there is no or partial improvement, then you are, these targeted blood patches could be uh, uh, repeated as well. And if there is a, sorry, if there is a associated subdural hematoma, if it is more than 10 mm, there is uncle herniation or cognitive deterioration, then uh, we can do a spinal, again, we can do a spinal imaging for localization, but if it is not available, uh, we can do a target, either do a uh, targeted epidural blood patch and then do a burr hole. As we had seen in our case, uh, doing a burr hole before doing a targeted epidural blood patch could just uh, lead to re recurrence of symptom and worsening of symptoms. So uh, this patient who had some SIH presented suddenly with a decreased uh, headache and worsening of sensorium. So this could be due to uh, SDH as was in our case, but it can also be due to some cerebral venous thrombosis, brainstem ischemia, a pituitary apoplexy could be reason for the sudden deterioration because of the engorged uh, pituitary that is occurring and uh, there could be a hemorrhage in the pituitary and duret hemorrhages in the midbrain can also be a cause for sudden deterioration. So there are certain risk factors for SDH in patients with SIH, and these include the clinical course, dural enhancement, uh, and uh, venous distension sign. All of these were present in our patient, and this could be the reason for SDH in our patient. And again, I would just like to stress once more that if there is a subdural hematoma, it should uh, the blood patch should be given before evacuating the hematoma, because otherwise there is a risk of further worsening. So the take-home message is that patients with a history of orthostatic headache, one should always suspect SIH. An MRI brain with contrast is a must in all cases. Uh, Non-traumatic bilateral SDH always exclude SD, uh, SIH before evacuation and if detected, SIH should be treated first before uh, treating the subdural hematoma. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ashish, for a lucid presentation and an interesting case again. And I think it gives us a lot of, uh, you know, learning uh, in the sense that uh, when uh, it is not necessary that a patient of SIH will develop a subdural hematoma, but when he does, uh, then uh, obviously the management becomes, uh, you know, kind of important. And uh, I think that mostly if there is uh, now a dictum that if there is an atraumatic uh, SDH, where you are not finding any obvious cause of trauma to account for SDH or you know anticoagulants or any other drugs, then uh, I think uh, you should always suspect the patient to having an SIH and do at least a contrast MR to look for the signs of SIH. Right. So that is number one lesson, and uh, you should one should not neglect that because what happens is that there is a general instinct that when you see an SDH, then you refer the patient to neurosurgeons. And uh, actually, that, that might be quite catastrophic, one. Uh, the <laughs> second point is this, of course, in the diagnostic criteria, although the CSF pressure uh, level is mentioned, but we never do an LP uh, pressure measurement to mm -hmm. diagnose SIH because that can actually you know, do more harm because the further there might be a volume loss and further the SIH symptoms and the clinical condition may deteriorate. So usually uh, now, until and unless we are, uh, you know, we know, lose out on all other diagnostic possibilities, then only we can do a CSF, right? So that is number two. Number three is this, that nowadays, I would actually go in for first of a heavily T2 weighted MR spine to find out the leak and we can do a, a you know, sequential upper uh, thoracic, cervical, thoracic and lumbar, and then we can find out the leak uh, with a reasonable degree of success, about 60%. I think 60 to 70% we can find out uh, through the heavily T2 weighted uh, MR. CT myelogram, conventional C2 myelogram is usually not very useful uh, in, in uh, finding out. What you need is a digital subtraction myelography, uh, yeah, CT yeah. digital side uh, subtraction myelography, and that is actually a very, very operator dependent and skill dependent procedure because you have to do it twice. Uh, you have to, and, and there are special you know, protocols for that. Uh, and special labs are doing it. For example, in Shevings lab, uh, lab in US, they are doing it in a particular manner, whereas in uh, Dodix, there is slightly different. But anyway, I mean, that requires some degree of expertise and, uh, you know, not all, you know, you cannot just get it uh, like that, you know, the digital uh, subtraction. Myelogram. But that gives the best result because then you can entirely see the 
uh, not only the location of the leak, but the nature of the leak. And based on the nature of the leak, and now there is a classification that is available in which you can, you can the leak may be because of a tear or it might be because of a fistula also. So it becomes grade three then. And uh, then, of course, your, your you know, uh, method of management changes because the grade three will not respond to blood patch. So that will need a surgical intervention. So therefore, I think uh, that is important in some cases, in refractory cases. Uh, the third thing is, of course, the blood patch. And I think it's a simple procedure. It should be uh, offered to all patients. And uh, generally, it is uh, uh, uncomplicated. But uh, important thing to remember again here is that a single patch may not be sufficient for all patients. Some patients may require two or more uh, blood patches uh, for their relief. And... Uh, Fourthly, about this postural component, the important point is that you know over a period of time this uh, pattern actually change, and people might not actually complain of this postural element so much, and they may just come to is a chronic daily headache. So when you evaluate a patient of chronic daily headache in a young person without a definitive episodic migraine uh, in the history. Uh, then you must must you must think about the possibility of SIH and you should ask that when it began, what was the nature of the headache? And then you can glean out the postural component out of it. That is one. And number two, in some patients, in about over 5% patients, you may actually have uh, the postural component uh, reverse. That is, they might become more symptomatic on uh, lying down and less on standing. Uh, actually, you, are, you people should read up uh, Bharam Mokris, who has done the pioneering work in SIH paper on the uh, physiology, neurophysiology of uh, uh, you know SIH. Essentially, although you are talking about hypotension, but this is not hypotension; it's hypovolemia, which is causing the uh, brain sag and the symptomatology. But uh, I think uh, your point is very well taken, and I think it, it was you know when we saw this case and we learned about it. We also didn't know that uh, what should be done, whether should we go for mm -hmm. NDH well first. And the general instinct is to get it done, you know. So, mm -hmm. but now I think mm -hmm. there is a reasonable evidence that we should first get the patch and uh, then followed by, if until unless the SDH is life threatening. Mm, so, we should get. Uh, so any other questions from the audience or any anybody? Dr. Ganguly? No, this is very. You explain it very excellently. Also, Asis is present very lucidly and explaining everything. <laughs> that is the learning stations. That is the whenever in SIT we get the subdural hematoma, automatic subdural hematoma. I should not be blindly referred it to the neurosurgeon. We have to take care of this patient. We took continuous touch with the patient even in referring this patient to the neurosurgeon and to follow up the cases. That is why we should learn properly this thing. Yeah, so, so I think Op Oprotim has written this, that MMA embolization is better than Burhol in uh, atraumatic. Yes, I, I agree completely that now actually the concept of SDS is also uh, changed and many people think that it's a misnomer. Uh, in some some sense, so yes, uh, in in atraumatic, uh, you can do the embolization, uh, middle uh, meningeal artery embolization, and that helps. And uh, so, but it, it, you know that that is again uh, mostly in the domain of uh, neuro intervention. So, uh, in, in the centers where they these are being done, then the surgeon may kind of consider it, but. Uh, in most of the centers, other centers, still people would like to go in for a barrel and bring the SDH. So I, I take that point. Yes, uh, that is definitely an important point to remember. Uh, so if there are no other questions, then I go move on to the third case by Dr. Ashwin Panda. He is uh, working as assistant professor uh, of neurology at uh, IVAS. Uh, so Dr. Ashwin, can you share your screen, please? It's a good evening. I, I hope the screen uh, is visible. Yeah, yeah. 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 So good evening, everyone. After two very exciting cases, wherein uh, it, there was uh, complex cases and a lot of discussion, we move on to a simple case, uh, which kind of elucidates the fact that uh, even in a busy OPD setup, if one takes a detailed history, one might uh, 
hone his skills and aid some aid to aid to the diagnosis. So this is a case where a pain is just an illusion. I'm Dr. Ashwin from Ibas, uh, New Delhi. So let's begin the case. So this is a 38 year old female uh, without any comorbidity. She presented to our OPD uh, with a new onset headache for almost uh, 40 days. So she had a lancinating pain in the right frontal area. She said that there was some dull aching pain in the uh, right frontal area, just above the right eyebrow. And then it started to have a lancinating nature, wherein uh, pain originated from uh, almost near the nasion and then extended towards the nose linearly in a straight line. So apart from the dull aching uh, pain in the right frontal area, there is a linear pain like 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 this drawing that you can see a dull aching uh, pain and a linear line starting from the nasion till almost the upper lip so this then changed over a period of few days the line shifted and uh, it started to affect the cheek so initially it started as a single line from almost the forehead to the upper lip and then it shifted and it started to move towards the cheek so these kind of pains happen three to four times a day and each time it lasted 15 minutes. So during these 15 minutes, she had this bounce of uh, lancinating pain, sometimes electric shock, like sometimes stabbing, and each of them lasting three to four seconds. She said that with most of those uh, pain bouts, she has features of lacrimation. And initially when it used to uh, reach the upper lip or the nose area, she used to have nasal stiffness, which then later... Uh, was not there and only lacrimation was present. So there was no stimulus sensitivity uh, along with this pain. There was no sensory loss either on the cheek, on the fr uh, frontal area or intraorally. And there were no secondary features apart from the fact that it was a sudden, it, it was a new onset pain. Apart from that, there was no systemic illnesses, no other uh, weight loss or uh, uh, visual difficulties or anything. On examination also, there was no focal deficit. So uh, as, as I've shown you the uh, photograph earlier. So phenotypically, we were kind of confused whether to put it as an unclassified headache or a, a trigeminal neuralgia or epicrania fugax. So it makes uh, prudent to you know go back to the IC HD3 classification and look at what the classification says. So it, it tells about uh, trigeminal neuralgia that it's a recurrent paroxysmal of, paroxysm of uh, unilateral facial pain in the trigeminal nerve region and not beyond the trigeminal nerve region. So uh, the pain can last from a fraction of a second to two minutes with a severe intensity, and it's an electric shock-like uh, quality, and it is generally precipitated by an innocuous stimuli, like probably air hitting on your face or chewing or even you know gargling some water in your mouth. So the patient did not uh, have a intensity of the pain, was generally bearable, it was not very severe. Uh, this, there was no stimulus sensitivity whatsoever. There were some autonomic features. And it went beyond one territory. As, as the diagram showed, it started from V1 and then it went on in a linear fashion towards V2. So we thought whether it is a trigeminal neuralgia or not. The other differential, of course, was epicrania fugax. So you know, epicrania fugax is a um, recurrent stabbing head pain, which uh, starts in one cranium, hemicranium lasting for one to 10 seconds and moves in a linear or a zigzag directory across the hemicranium. So the point against it was it did not start from the usual sites, which we will discuss later, like the occipital or the parietal areas, and then move on to the eyebrow. But it started on to the frontal region, somewhere in the supraorbital nerve region, and then on to the face. But yes, it was not static. It did move from A to B on, 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 on uh, history. The patient um, specified that, yes, the pain moves from the forehead and ends up in the cheek area. And then he, she has some autonomic features. So now as there was a dilemma and uh, we need to rule out secondary causes before that, so an MRI was done and a CP angle uh, mass was found out. And on a T2 lesion, you can see that it is extra axial uh, and uh, there is some CSF space in between. Uh, unfortunately, it was not a contrast image, so we can't see the dural tail. So probably a CP angle tumor or meningioma or a schwannoma, schwannoma being uh, more commoner than meningioma in that area, causing more likely an epicrania fugax-like symptoms than a trigeminal neuralgia. That is what we thought. So these are two uh, articles. Uh, initially, uh, Bareja et al. have described epicrania fugax, and uh, this is a review of the same in 2016, and this is... Uh, report of eight cases with uh, some really novel features. Uh, 
presented by uh, Dr. Devashish sir. So these are two articles that uh, helped us uh, get through this uh, dilemma. So what is epicrania fugax for, for, for especially the residents and also someone, because it's a very rare uh, thing to see in uh, OPD. So it is good to revise what it is. So it's a, as I said, it's a recurrent stabbing pain paroxysm, which moves from posterior to anterior usually. It starts from one territory and then moves to another nerve territory, usually in a zigzag line. So it can start from the occipital area, parietal area or a temporal scalp and then radiate forward till it reaches the forehead, temple, eye or the ipsilateral nose. It has a stabbing electric-like quality. It is unilateral, short-lasting. It may have a moderate to severe score on VAS scale, but apart from the zigzag nature, it can also be linear. It is seen that one third of the patients have autonomic features along with this pain, uh, which is usually lacrimation being the most common, but then nasal stuffiness, uh, conjunctival tearing uh, can also be seen. Some patients have an interictal tenderness, burning type pain or a pain of pulsatile quality in the region wherein the pain originates, which kind of complicates the uh, scenario and brings in other differentials into the play. So what are the usual atypicalities that can be seen with epic, uh, epicrania fugax? That instead of the sagittal movement like, uh, like in point A, uh, in, in figure A or figure B, the sagittal movement, sometimes patient can have Coronal movements also across the hemicranium. It can also extend to the limbs. It may be multidirectional. And lately, some facial variants of the same have also been described. So this is a figure that I have taken from uh, the article of Dr. Devashish that I was uh, mentioning before. So they have actually uh, mentioned the various sites and the progression of the pain in these seven, eight patients. Uh, one of them who had a cranial pa uh, pain cranial pain towards the neck and in fact radiating even towards the limbs. In fact, on the uh, image F, one can see that the radiation towards the uh, facial region is also present. So uh, whether this facial pain which is radiating upwards could be an epicrania fugax, which is a facial variant. This is a article um, which, uh, which, we, which we found and they have mentioned five uh, patients uh, with this epicrania fugax type uh, manifestations in all these the patients, the pain has radiated from lower from the face to the uh, upper side, that is from the cheek to the forehead or the upper lip to the forehead. So these are the facial variants of the uh, epicrania fugax. As I was telling, what are the differentials in uh, VZOPD when you hear somebody explaining a linear zigzag kind of a pain, nemular headache is one of them, primary stabbing occipital neuralgia, supraorbital neuralgia, and trigeminal neuralgia. These are the four or five things that could come to your mind. Uh, just to recap what a primary stabbing headache is, it's a headache in which there is either one stab or a series of stabs, each lasting few seconds from one to two seconds to 120 seconds, and they can uh, occur at a irregular frequency, but there are no autonomic symptoms which our patient had. Then there is nemular headache. A nemural headache, uh, the, uh, it looks like the interictal burning or a sharp contoured pain uh, that epicrania fugax patient might have so that uh, clinicians might confuse it with the same. So it's a continuous or intermittent head pain, which is sharply contoured, fixed in size, round or elliptical and one to six centimeter in diameter. Then comes occipital neuralgia. Occipital neuralgia is a unilateral or bilateral pain. Uh, which has at least two of the characters. So it can have a recurrence, recurring paroxysmal attacks, which last from few seconds to minutes. It, it has to be severe. It has to be shooting and stabbing or sharp in quality. So two out of these three. And pain is associated with diesthesias or allodynia or tenderness and trigger points uh, in the same area. And the pain can be uh, blocked by an anesthetic block. So these are the, uh, the major differentials that comes up with a rare kind of phenotype as epigrania fugax. So how does pathogenesis come, uh, explain this kind of a pain? So now uh, the usual pathogenesis that has been explained for epigrania fugax is that there is a peripheral generator because it, the pain generally uh, stems from a, a fixed focal area and such a peripheral source could be superficial terminal branches of the occipital or terminal nerves. But uh, in cases where it extends beyond uh, the cranium goes to the face or towards the neck or towards the arms, central pain generators are also uh, implicated. So there can be an hyperexcitability or aphthatic transmission involving the brain pathways, 
within the thalamus brain or the spinal cord. So maybe in this um, patient, the compression has caught some ectatic uh, transmission. So probably the first, uh, as the fiber started to get involved, uh, the pain migrated from the medial to the lateral side. So the treatment is generally gabapentine, <laughs> lamotrigine, carbamazepine, amitriptyline, and nerve blocks. Uh, in this patient, we gave uh, gabapentine 300 milligram TDS. The pain of the stabbing nature and the linear uh, prog progression uh, features, they was completely relieved in uh, one week, but the dull aching frontal area pain remained. So the patient is still in our follow-up and uh, the blink reflex is uh, weighted and uh, we have referred the patient for uh, removal of the tumor for the same. Uh, so with this, I uh, end this uh, small case and uh, thank you and uh, a very happy new year to all of you. Thank you, Ashwin. I think that's a wonderful case. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, because uh, why I say it's wonderful is because that in most of the OPDs, when such patients come, when you cannot make out a head and tail of it, these patients will summarily be dismissed and uh, they will be sent back or with, with, with some level or without some level, without any diagnosis, right? And uh, because these are very, very atypical, rare and you cannot really make sense out of it until unless you know about the entity, right? Um, about your first differential of a trigeminal neuralgia, that it's very unlikely because you know the trigeminal neuralgia will has to follow the branches of the trigeminal nerve, and uh, and uh, when they follow involve even if they are involving the V1 and V2, then they follow a particular pattern over face, and it's not a straight coming down from the top of the you know. Uh, forehead down to the cheeks. So that pattern is, we don't see in uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So, and also the linearity, you know, uh, the particular linearity that, that that's uh, unlikely to be trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, Epicania figures, by definition, uh, one important thing is that it's not only a zigzag or linear thing, but it has to traverse from one uh, nerve territory to another nerve territory. So, uh, in a way that here you can say the two divisions of the trigeminal nerve territory that are affected and therefore the, that facial variant that people are talking about, you know. So, even though even though you have a single nerve, but the two divisions are separately represented, right? So, uh, the other point, other thing which you might consider is a, a supraorbital neuralgia because, uh, you know, here also the supraorbital nerve get uh, can get uh, because of any pathology or uh, it can get activated and then you can, but usually the pain moves up uh, uh, in, in, from the uh, bro uh, to the up, but occasionally it may move down also, right? Um, in the differential of what you said about uh, the differential, I think I would also like to add an auriculotemporal neuralgia. That is, again, will be very difficult to distinguish actually from guys because that will be in and around and with the with the with a kind of a facial and the temple component uh, of the pain, right? So, uh, so all these individual neuralgias are uh, you know uh, important to consider. But since it is definitely coming in a straight linear fashion, so I will go in most likely to be a case of secondary epicranial fibrax type of uh, facial variant of epicranial fibrax type of uh, pain. So until unless people are aware that such an entity exists, people will dismiss it as a you know fiction of the mind of the patient, and they will just straight off give some either you know they can give gabapentin or pregabalin because of a, knowing the neuralgic part of the pain, but they will never uh, be able to go to the diagnosis. And of course, all such atypical cases needs to be imaged, and you uh, did that. So uh, your uh, you know your 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 pathology showing that there is a CP angle tumor. So how do you think that that tumor is uh, causing this kind of pain? I mean, it is uh, uh, because it's an extra axial uh, pathology, essentially. And uh, so I, do you think that it is causing some degree of uh, compression at the, uh, because, you know, that looks like that is more like a seventh eighth that is uh, involved. Uh, so fifth, how do you account for the fifth involvement because the distribution is in fifth so what do you think about that maybe that ectatic transmission kind of a thing or compression of the root exit i mean the root of the nerve at that exit zone maybe i mean maybe yeah, a more so dedicated need... maybe a more dedicated phase or a cis sequence might tell us the extent of the you know spread. Yeah. 
So I think I think in such cases you should actually uh, ask the uh, neuro uh, radiologist to look at the film again and to look at whether what, what kind of nerves uh, you know extra axillary are getting affected because that can give you a clue and then probably you can write this down. I mean this is uh, this is a good case and uh, this is a rare thing and uh, it it is going to uh, really enhance our knowledge because there are. A lot of case reports of, you know, the CP angle tumors may making a lot of primary headaches, right? Yes, Aparatim, I, I, I know that you are saying cyst sequence. Yes, cyst sequence obviously would be an uh, important thing. We should know that what are the, you know, kind of uh, grain nerves that are getting involved by this uh, tumor, right? Agreed. Professor Ganguly? Uh, there is, a, I think, during this COVID period, mucor mycosis, uh, cases sometimes initially presented such pain what I have seen this but during that time initially what we have thought to be a case of trigeminal neuralgia and the latter on when it it was extensive that mucor mycosis and after going through the literature uh, everything this is like this epicurious fugus like pain right but we lost the patient. That is the okay. mucor mycosis during COVID era. Yeah. So I, I think that all secondary causes need to be looked into and uh, one cannot really... Uh, yeah, that should be... Jump into... Uh, even and the say that this is primary only. That should be... And another thing I think, Ashwin, uh, is yeah. that there are in the reports uh, about 20% of the patients of uh, epicardia fugax will have a, a sense of, uh, you know, the origin from where the pain begins and uh, you know uh, transmits, they may have a similar kind of a you know area which you said that can, there is a localized area. Basically, that sure the frontal area pain, the dull, uh, yeah, rectal pain that she was initially complaining about, and then it started to get linear. Probably right. that is the area. so. Right. So, so maybe, it is well, it is so well maybe, defined. Like about twenty percent, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, patients will have a. Kind of a similar onset uh, pain here to start with, and then they go on to have a. So, if we consider that area to be the generator in that sense, can then supraorbital uh, neuralgia be kind of the prime differential in this case, other than the other things that you were talking about? Supra yeah, that will definitely come as a differential. So I mean, that will definitely need to become as a differential. And. Uh, and 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 uh, sometimes what happens that in this case you are lucky that you are got a, a lesion to account for you know at least uh, the pain and it is uh, concordant with the you know side and uh, but uh, if you don't then uh, you might there are reports of you know going into higher modalities like doing uh, even a PET scan to see if there is a small fibrotic band or compression. In fact, uh, Sanjay uh, from Raipur has uh, you know shown published a paper uh, recently in practical neurology where a lot of uh, Hansen cases, uh, uh, he has shown that Hansen cases having, have uh, produced a supraorbital neuralgia type of pain and uh, he, he could actually feel the you know, thickened nerve there on palpation. Uh, so that is, a, that is another thing which we should consider when there is, is this kind of a distribution where you have just above the eyebrow uh, a pain and uh, then that is a shooting, lancinating kind of a pain. So, so I think uh, we need to look at that. So even uh, occipital neuralgia, for example, a refractory of uh, which, which was you know you said about this kind of neuralgias. So occipital neuralgia also there might be a secondary pathology, not as a tumor, but uh, something like a small band, fibrotic band, an aberrant blood vessel, mm, uh, you know, just coursing over the. Um, uh, greater occipital nerve. So you uh, and the the uh, normal imaging will completely miss them. Will completely miss them until and unless you are insistent on this thing that this kind of thing happens. And secondly, another situation, clinical situation, I'll tell you can happen is that uh, in in cases of a uh, post MVD trigeminal neuralgia, sometimes the post MVD trigeminal neuralgia will abate dramatically after the operation once uh, the surgeon puts that uh, you know felt uh, there and uh, but sometimes that might actually uh, you know kind of act as an irritant and i have seen a few cases where actually secondarily they have got the exacerbations after 
say a few months or years, uh, one year or so, and the pain is coming down to, and, and once again, they are open and then that is taken off, the pain goes off, actually. So that is again a, a thing which, so therefore a kind of a structural, uh, uh, you know, structural obstructive pathology uh, encasing this uh, single nerves uh, should always be considered when you are having such a localized kind of a uh, phenotype that you should always remember. Thank you, sir. So I think uh, we had, uh, you know, three lovely cases and I think all of us have gained in one way or other. And uh, um, so I think it's time to conclude. Uh, I wish everybody, all the members, I, I wish that there will be more members. And Ashish, I think you should ask for rec recurring to send again and again mails asking for participation. And uh, yes, I, think, I think from next to this thing, we might also change a little bit about, uh, you know, we discussed that in the last meeting, Ashish. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you create a telegram group also or and uh, and also uh, you know already we have got a whatsapp group no what? we have a whatsapp group what yeah uh, we have whatsapp in, group so in the whatsapp group you send start sending messages every day every meeting before the meeting also you start sending them that please attend we want more people to attend this because they are all uh, you know will affect the practice and the day to day practice and uh, you know, the, the beautiful image that Aparatim showed about, uh, you know, how, how will the person will see a, a small, uh, you know, blister aneurysm of thalamic artery and then getting, by using a flow diameter, it is getting, uh, you know, slowly getting off. So all these things, they're knowledge uh, thing and people will not get this. So I think more and more people should be attracted, especially the youngsters. What do you yeah. say, Professor Ganguly? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. That should be. That is why I pursue a protein. You have the. You have to present the case in our platform headache subsections, mm -hmm. and he agreed. And I also hope the all the members they have to prepare. They have to present the new cases, new interesting cases each and every time. Right. That will help a lot, and it is a learning session for us also. I think. Uh, it's a, a learning session for us also. This was beautiful evaluative cases. Right, right. So probably so, because of the holidays, it's is... a new year tomorrow. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe no, no, no. Yeah, 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 attendance yeah. is low. No, well, that is the reason. Obviously, though, forty-two. This is a forty-two have attended our today's sessions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually, we tell so, I want, I want, I want, Ashish, I will give you credit. Yeah, that is the definitely. <laughs> yeah, I will give you the credit when it goes to 200. You should try to get it 200. Right? Yeah, sure, sir. Definitely. We'll try. Under your guidance, we will try. Uh, yeah. uh, look, I should get in more residents to come yeah. into this because this yeah. is a very good learning experience, as you uh, said. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you that can ask, be, ask. Because the, you know, there should be the WhatsApp group or something. We have to include the resident. Yes. And also ask uh, individually the HODs of the uh, at least the teaching institutes and major institutes, private institutes, so that mm -hmm. their residents can join. You know, it's uh, very important. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so. Next time yeah, I yeah. will send the uh, mail uh, right. to other institutes also. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful uh, 2024 and uh, be safe. And uh, probably all of you, I'll see you in Vizac. Uh, annual conference of IN and uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you.